So following Adam's theme about shoes, this talk is a boots to the ground perspective of some relevant observations that, to climate that follow from both my studies and some anecdotal observations. So I've been working in the Eastern Sierra in the Western Great Basin for several decades. And it's, I feel quite strongly that as research <coughs> scientists and managers and climate monitors, policy makers, that it's really our obligation to be on the ground and to witness these processes that we study and manage firsthand. And so I like to think of endowing ourselves as being personal monitors or self-monitors. Not that we're monitoring ourselves, but that's important too. But that we extend the instrumental monitoring capacity by being out on the land and trusting our observations. And I, as an evolutionary biologist, I have a very strong sense that mammals have an evolved capacity for pattern recognition, and especially recognizing when patterns change. So I think we can trust these, you might doubt at the end of my talk, um, and use them as hypotheses for watching in the future and feeding into the more rigorous instrumental data. So, my approach to mountain climacology, which is the phrase I use for what I think I do, which is looking at the responses of ecosystems to climate change, both in the distant, the deep past and ongoing and into the future, is to begin with the sense that mountains create complex environments. They have complex geomorphology and topography, they have distinct soils and substrates, and they create these amazing arranges of niches. They also develop complex climates. And I'm especially interested in both temporal and spatial scales and how that might relate to biota and, vice, and corollary, how it relates to things that we manage. So for studying animals like American pika, who lives in a 50 meter range from their, their central spot to mountain lion that will range for hundreds of kilometers, they might intersect these differences in microclimate to macroclimate very differently. And we need to be aware of these scales. So from the largest scale of synoptic climatology, hemispheric or western North American region, down to microclimates where we're really talking about the climate that occurs in a very small region. So it could be under a forest canopy or the little backside of that rock that I showed you. And these matter, this scale matters a lot. So we really need to match scale and keep that very much in mind, I think. Because of this, complex environments, complex climates, that the biota respond complexly and individually. So really keeping this in mind. And many of the projections that are being made, they're more at the average. And I think what's really important about this meeting is that we're trying to focus on these different <coughs> scales and finding the right scale that's important. So if you hear a regional projection, you might think, well, how does the animal or plant that I work with respond? And maybe those microclimates are somewhat decoupled from these higher scales, as I'll show you in some of my examples. So for an example, I'm a forest ecologist. One of the things that's quite considered um, iconic now is that plants and animals are moving up. They're going to move up the, off the top with warming, go to heaven. So it's, it really isn't when you use your self-monitoring as well as, as more rigorous scientific method, it isn't the only response to warming, as I will show you. So this is kind of a potpourri of things that I both study and think about and, and maybe make fantasy stories about, but starting from the ones that I, that I am more engaged in in a scientific way. Um, the alpine response to climate change, alpine ecosystems, especially alpine plants, there is a global international program called Gloria, a global observation research initiative in alpine environments. Um, we've heard about that mentioned. So the, I'm the chair of the North American chapter. We now have 25 what are called target regions in North America. And each target region comprises four mountain, whoops, four mountain summits. And they start from upper tree line and they go to the highest elevation of the mountains in your region. And the idea is to have a very similar protocol at every target region with these summits being monitored in a very uh, strict way. And the, the brilliance of this idea was that I think that it, by being on mountain summits, the mountain summits sense more the macroclimate. They're sticking their noses up into that more large scale climatology than maybe down in a canyon bottom or behind a rock. So these are very comparable. They may be better as a global sensors, 
than they are as local or regional sensors. So we participate in this. They're, they're primarily for alpine plants. The summits are monitored every five years. We now have in the Great Basin region eight of these target regions that comp each comprise three or four summits. And as you can see, three in the Sierra, two in the White Mountains, Sweetwaters, Death Valley, and Great Basin in the Snake Range. And so this, the international network, you can see it extends north and southern hemispheres. So we're tied into that. This is all available on their websites. The data are, are accessible. So we have got now gone through one five year for all of them. And this year will be the first 10 year remeasurement. And the take home lesson is that, that these systems aren't changing very fast. We don't see a lot of obvious hit you in the face differences yet. It may be that things go much slower here. We, what we do see is sort of the most dramatic. We put soil temperature thermocrons in, and the soils have increased quite dramatically over a short term. So you might think that would influence the biota, but so far we haven't much seen a change. And the diversity changes that we do see, we're not sure if that's maybe due to different botanists and different identifications or different phenology. Things are blooming. We didn't notice there were plants before. So it's going to be a while before we can tease that out. <coughs> So one of my bread and butter research areas is the subalpine response, response of conifers to climate. And I have a few different topics here where I've sort of observations which I think are consistent or are, are worth noting. Uh, the, the main take home lesson from, the, from this whole topic is that the response really varies by species and it varies by mountain range within the Great Basin. There's some things that are consistent and one that you might think is kind of small change is what I consider this infilling of formerly persistent snow fields below tree line. So if we look backwards a bit, uh, the last several centuries were much cooler, what's considered worldwide the little ice age. And there had been, in addition to mountain glaciers, there were snow fields below tree line, which were persistent late into the summer and inhibited any growth into them. And over the 20th century, like glaciers, these have been melting. And so they're infilling with conifers. They're on not, usually on north slopes. They're well watered. They're cool. And there's been a gradual invasion from the outside or recruitment from the outsides into the insides. And they're actually, they're actually more than, than you think. It's quite common once your eye clues into these. So here are a couple of examples. There's hemlock in, um, in the Sierra. There's some white bark pine and lodgepole. It's quite a bit in the sweet waters. Here's the Bodie Hills. Brawley Peak, this, this is sort of a typical context, north slopes. And so these are just creating part of that infill. So I see this widely across the Great Basin um, and across many different species. So it's starting to be one of the changes that we, what we notice. In addition to that specific environmental context, there's a, there's a general subalpine forest infill. And lots of people are noting this. It's also noted more in the, in the middle, mixed conifer, middle montane regions, but there it gets more confounded with fire and land use. And it's one of the nice reasons for working in both the alpine and the subalpine is there's much less um, interaction with land use and fire because it's just not as present. So here are repeat photos from the Vales uh, on Gaylor Peak right above the Tioga entrance station. You can see the, the increase in forest density. And this uh, ongoing by the studies of Chris DeLonk and Jim Thorne throughout the Sierra Nevada. So that's really very commonly seen. And this is occurring without an increase in tree line elevation. So it all is pretty much below upper tree line. And just one example, but um, I'm working much more around the Great Basin outside of this Eastern Sierra now. And I see this very commonly. Here's again the same tree line species. White bark pine is the dominant conifer in the pine forest range north of the uh, Black Rock Desert. And it's the same thing, and the ages are quite continuous. So every year there's a little bit more, there's new recruitment of these, of these trees in. Another pattern is that the subalpine conifers change adaptively in form and growth, in both response to the climate that's coming down on them, and then climate that comes up from where they sit in the environment. And we've been studying in earlier part, last 10 years ago, the form changes of white bark pine, which is really a supremely plastic species and very much accommodating uh, its spot in the environment. And it can go from what are called krumholz, which are these very low mats, which you've no doubt seen at, at tree line, 
to upright trees with sort of everything in between. And the climate that a mat like that experiences, more like an alpine plant, it can be extremely different than the climate that an upright tree experiences with the shade cast by the, the crown on the ground and soil moisture being very different. So it'll be very warm here on, near the surface. There's snow covered more so they're protected in winter. And we've seen this be very responsive to both space and time. So originally we had seen that these flags, which we call, really started to grow up in the mid-century. And then they died, and we could do this because as a tree ring scientist, we can core these and find the ages and date the, the pulse. So they were very much in that period, which uh, you've, you've probably noted from Kelly's longer terms, was a period of relative cooler, more stable climates. Not quite sure why that related to the flag growth, but probably something to do with snow cover and wind shear at the Krumholtz crown level. Another very common, I'm sure we all noticed this, is conifers recruiting into subalpine meadows. Uh, it's often interpreted as uh, effects of former uh, historic sheep grazing or current or historic 20th century land use. In the early part of the 20th cent 21st century, we did a study looking at 10 different meadows, including Kualmi, where there was a, a range of times when grazing was stopped as well as a range of fire history differences, different elevations and aspects. And we found the only consistent trend was relationship to climate. So it's our interpretation that in much of Western North America, the response of mostly lodgepole pine, but also other subalpine conifers moving into meadows is a climate response. And interestingly, even though there'll be very different sizes from dating and aging these trees, we see that they were also in this same pulse that I meant of time in the mid-century that I mentioned for the flags on the white bark pine. And this does correlate with a relatively stable period of moisture, a cooler period. There was a little drier, so we think groundwater in the meadows may have decreased enough so that this, the seeds that did germinate were able to actually get established and persist. Because this process happens almost annually, but then it will reverse if it's wet then the trees will die and the, the meadow species persist longer. So it is a question about management. The, at least in Yosemite, the policy has been to clear cut these seedlings to maintain meadow conditions. Uh, the seedlings just want to come back in there. So here, I don't know if you can see, but one year after the harvest, here these uh, seedlings are coming back into Tuolumne Meadows again. So the question of, is that appropriate? What is the whole Park Service wrestling with maintaining naturalness or um, maintaining societal um, desires to have that meadow, recognizing that some meadows, um, because of the decline in meadows, uh, they're, so they serve very important biotic reservoirs, so designating some that might be maintained. I think it's the, just the important thing to acknowledge the process is that it, there's going to be this tide of recruitment into meadows and where would we want to try to halt it? Is it appropriate to do that for how long? And then a kind of honest interpretation to the visitors about the processes and why you were doing that. So then sort of the question that folks are all looking for is what about conifer expansion above upper tree line? And we set out a number of years ago to do a big study on this. We were all set, we had our design ready and we were going to do this on white bark pine in the Sierra Nevada, but we couldn't find any places where it was moving up. So all of the young recruitment was below tree line that was, that was not, there were really just not enough areas to measure. So we found in white bark pine there was no significant uphill movement yet. Uh, it's a, again, this capacity for plasticity seems to be able to accommodate climate variation. Our colleagues, tree ring colleagues, have noted that White bark pine in the Sierra can hold upper tree line elevation for up to 1,700 years, was as long as they were able to measure. And that this ability to change form seemed to be enough to accommodate those changes at least that far that happened in the last 1,700 years. Some other species that don't seem to be, this is more anecdotal, I haven't studied these. Uh, well, bristlecone I have. The bristlecone pine in the White Mountains. It's, um, it's doing a lot of fair amount of recruiting, but not above upper tree line. This is Campedo Mountain, where the famous studies of the Holocene movement above tree line. You can see 
the dead wood that's uh, bristlecone pine above the current live stands, but there's really no movement of bristlecone pine, significant movement uphill. Similarly with the relative foxtail pine in the southern Sierra, infilling, yes, but not movement up. So we ended up working with limber pine, which was suiting our purposes perfectly. It is moving up slope in the Sierra Nevada and many of the Great Basin ranges where I've observed. It's leapfrogging above bristlecone pine at this point. Who knows what will happen in the, in the end of the game. Uh, everything you see here that's green is limber pine. And the deadwood here is all bristlecone pine. So these are areas of historic bristlecone pine forest, which now limber pine is moving up. Classically, we have thought of limber pine as having a tree line, upper tree line that's 300 meters below bristlecone's upper tree line. Now it's beating bristlecone. Um, it seems to be in areas of dolomite soils, at least on the plateau south of White Mountain Peak, which is also kind of goes against the, the accepted idea that bristlecone's on dolomites and limber pine is on the non-carbonates. This also seems to be pulsed. It's a different pulse. So we've aged those trees. Um, as of we were doing these studies around 2007 and 8, and the pulse was this between 1970 and 91. We're still having a hard time teasing out correlations, uh, but they seem to be associated with warmer and wetter springs, warmer falls, autumns, which would enable the seedlings to both germinate and be established in that very harsh environment. So because um, we figured we ought to get on the ball and publish this eventually. We went back and resurveyed uh, this summer because we felt we ought to fill in the gap here for those years that we hadn't done anything. So we went around back to all of our sites. This was not just the White Mountains, but a number of ranges around the basin. And we found that there was another pulse that had begun around 2008 and 9, and it really wasn't ongoing. We didn't see many um, seedlings in recent years, but there was a very common pulse that was that age. This is under Boundary Peak and you can see it marching upslope there. So we'll, we looked in all our other places and that was a very common pulse beyond that uh, 1990 period where the episode stopped. So this is Mount Jefferson in the Tokima. You can see the same kind of thing. The plateau here is almost 12,000 feet, so it's marching up on a lot of different aspects. Here there's no former bristlecone forest, um, obviously, because species doesn't grow here, and it doesn't seem to be in areas there where there's relic wood. So that's a bit of a difference. In the Snake Range, we don't find bristlecone or limber pine moving above our tree line. It's, it's Engelmann spruce that's moving up. So here are those two pines are doing more infilling. It's a very different climatic region, um, and limbers and bristlecone are probably responding to that. Uh, another thing that we're seeing, which is, um, I think it flies a little bit in the face of what we might expect, is that limber pine in the Great Basin is moving downslope. And so here's an example. This is the Pine Creek in the Mount Jefferson portion of the Tokima Range. And limber pine uh, grows primarily above about 9,200 feet. So this is limber pine's zone up here and the pine pinion woodlands below. But in these ranges, Great Basin Ranges, where there hasn't been glaciation down to the valley floors, the lower canyons uh, remain very narrow, deep ravines with cliff sides, and they're choked with riparian vegetation of birch and uh, willow and cottonwood. And the Southern Sierra is similar to that too, where the, the glaciers are more inset and they don't come down to the valley floor. So in those lower riparian regions, even though we think of pines not germinating and growing well in that kind of dense riparian organic soils, limber pine is going to town. And that started around 2010. Um, and I'm seeing, I've been coming into this area for about nine years and I've been seeing that accelerating after that. And I've seen this also in these other ranges. So another uh, part of bread and butter part of my research is looking at subalpine forest mortality. We've looked at the limber pine event, mortality event in the late 20th century. Uh, in the Sierra, white bark pine, you're all probably aware of that, mortality event in the Sierra. And limber pine was at the same time dying in the Great Basin Ranges during that period, but not in the Sierra. This looks like it's what's being called a classical global warming style drought uh, mortality event. Background elevated temperatures intersecting with periodic droughts, stressing the trees, native uh, bark beetles coming in, you know the story, creating this mortality pulse. 
So we've seen in both the white bark pine and the limber pine events in the Sierra that it's a very similar environmental context. It tends to be at the north, northeast slopes, maybe not what you would think to be more uh, wet areas, but no, in fact, it's the cooler slopes. There are lower elevations uh, for the species range there. There are areas where there's little drainage from above, so they're out on the ends of ridges, out on the far part of the escarpment. And they correlate with high climatic water deficits in the soils. So here are June Mountain, Hilton, Glass Creek, Wing. You could see the, um, I think in this last slide, this is very typical of the year of, of uh, fading and death in the tree, so you can tell by this copper color that the tree is just, is, in, is dying. And once it gets brown, of course, that in the interior, then it's just dead. So um, although there's reason for concern, there's also reason for hope in that in both of those cases we've seen, and we could go into this, the, the whys and hows in, uh, in discussion later, but the mortality serves beneficially in two ways. First is a silvical thinning. It creates these stands on the north slope tend to be young, crowded, they're growing very tight conditions. So the mortality doesn't wipe out everything. There's about 60% mortality. The trees that remain are more widely spaced. So they're more, less subject to beetle attack in the future. And in fact, those stand, limber stands in the 1980s did not die, as I said, in the Sierra in the current drought. So they seem to have gained some defense that way. Similarly, the trees that remain, and this is the part we could go into later, uh, appear to be genetically better adapted to warming conditions of the present and the future. So there was a, a genetic selection event from this mortality as well. And interestingly, around the Great Basin, so I've been seeing fading up through last year, and I've continued to go back and monitor the sites where there had been in the Great Basin, both with limber and whitebark pine, and I use the word ended here, that's probably inappropriate, in 2013, this summer, I didn't see any ongoing fading. If it's ended, that would be nice. It just stopped this summer, at least. So here's the Sierra Nevada. You can see the old skeletons with, no, uh, fit, with none of the copper fading that would indicate current year death. White bark pine in the pine forest range, northwest Nevada. <clears throat> uh, the northern Warner Mountains were very hard hit. They suffered some of the highest mortality of white bark during this last 2007 to 12 event. It's entirely stopped there now as well. Uh, white bark pine also dominant conifer in the East Humboldt and, and Ruby Ranges also uh, this summer has stopped. Um, and in fact, you might see a few there and you say, oh, am I just skipping over those? Well, there's one of the problems with this white bark pine crisis is, so I would say you have to characterize it, is that um, there's often a misinterpretation of, of mortality. So if you could read this, this is in the Ruby, Lamoille Canyon area. If you could read this sign, this is a tree that the Humboldt Tayabi is collecting cones from for potential white pine blister rust. But in fact, there is no white pine blister rust in there, in that canyon. And the cause of mortality there is a, is a, blister, is a mistletoe. So I have gone out with several of the, white, the blister rust experts and they have not been able to find any. So there is this misinterpretation, I think a kind of extension of what we think might be happening without careful attribution of cause. And just in case you are worried because there's the concern about grizzly bears, not that we have grizzly bears, and white bark dying back, just a reminder that our grizzly bears have pinion, or our black bears have um, pinion harvests to take advantage of. This is the Bodie Hills the last weekend. There was just Grand Central Station with the bears out there rampaging um, the pinions. So even if we do have some years of mortality, our bears um, have a lot of alternative food. So around the Great Basin with uh, limber pine, that was the white bark pine story, these ranges had suffered very high mortality. Limber pine and Engelman spruce in the Snake Range. This is, of course, looking a view from the pinion juniper, but the forests are very green now. Uh, Tokima Range, same thing. White Mountains, Limber Pine, Trail Canyon, very green now where we would be seeing, uh, had been seeing coppery in the last six years. So uh, uh, this is getting a little bit more on thin ice because I don't study pinion, but I will say it anyway. I have a very strong, um, Opinion, I guess, is the best way to say it, about opinion expansion, which we recognize as expanding throughout the Great Basin region, um, expanding upslope, expanding downslope, 
expanding within the main range. Of course, the conflict with sagebrush stiff and, and sage grouse. Uh, I'm not a pinion um, ecologist, um, I, but I do react somewhat, I'll say for why in a minute. So the, the management uh, reaction here is outright war on, on pinion, um, driven, of course, by what we expect of the Endangered Species Act to be listing uh, at least the sagebrush or sage grouse population in our area. This whole area clear cut here uh, in the east side of the Sweetwaters as a habitat improvement project. So my opinion comes more as a paleoecologist looking at the longer term response opinion to climate. It's highly uh, temperature sensitive, highly climate sensitive. Uh, these numbers are the times where uh, pinion pine was years ago, years before present, and its most recent um, appearance in the Western Great Basin follows this trend where it was even outside the Great Basin during the last glacial periods and moved up, so it was into interior as well, has uh, been moving north and reaching current northern distribution only recently. So my sense of it is um, that this is pinion pine's climate period to go everywhere. Yes, there are interactions with fire in the in the lowlands, but there's so many places where it's extending, especially above tree line and areas that are open and rocky. That um, it's, it's a question to me about reasonableness or appropriateness to work on trying to stem that tide, which I think we will encounter more and more as climates change. And we're trying to hold things to prior conditions or restore them to conditions even earlier. Are we able to do that? Is it appropriate? So one thing that I am, uh, feel more confident to speak of. I've been studying um, Okotoma princeps, the American uh, pika, for the last 10 years. You might know that it also has been petitioned for endangered species listing under both federal and state laws. And there's been a concern that it's an alpine species, that it um, has poor thermal regulation capacity, is sensitive to warming, will move up slope, and uh, similarly go off the tops of mountains. So we have been doing inventories over the last uh, 10 years. <coughs> now have over um, 800 sites. This was when we published in 2010. The bottom line here is that uh, in our region, and that doesn't extend into the Central Great Basin, I'm now speaking of the Eastern Sierra and the Western Great Basin, Pika is, appears to be doing very well. It has an extensive elevational span here in the Mono Basin and in the um, White Mountains of over 5,000 feet which is a giant elevation range. It goes from sagebrush communities, pinion communities, up to above tree line. Why is it able to accommodate that? Well, partly for, I think, microclimate reasons. Pikas, if you don't know, are dependent on talus as habitat. So they live in these rocky taluses. We've been studying the thermal regime of these taluses, which are highly decoupled from external environment. They set up a circulation patterns that are very distinct in winter versus summer. They have their own climate regimes internally. They're buffered in summer. They stay very cold, cold enough to support ice. They are, by being snow covered in the winter, the pika stay inside um, under the snow cover. They have a very, it's like they've got that dashboard of climate control. They don't have to press the buttons. But it's a very um, controlled environment where they live. And because the, 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 the add-on is with this internal ice, these areas in support persistent springs. Uh, because the ice is there present, so they, um, they're wetter longer than other non talus or rock glacier springs, and so they provide this habitat for forage that the pikas need. They only move um, a very short distance out from the talus. Interestingly, uh, if you could think back both your memory and Kelly's talk about the different winters, we might think that these uh, thermally sensitive species would have done better in the winter of high snowpack. In fact, many of us report that they were doing poorly in the summer following that heavy snowpack year. Here's the snowpack around Saddlebag Lake and you know, well into where we would expect it to be, the snowpack to be gone. Um, they, we could go into this too if you're interested, but there are a lot of, of, of us thinking about the reasons why. Were they under the snow too long? They hadn't collected enough, uh, enough food. Um, did they have too short a summer to collect for the next year? I keep house rabbits and have for 20 years, so I learn from them. Their pikas are related to rabbits. And when they produce more of the cecal, cecotropes, which is the other kind of excrement that rabbits do, you know something's wrong. And this was very dominant throughout the summer of 2011. When it happens in rabbits, it means they're eating too much 
green vegetables, you put them immediately on, on dried vegetation. So uh, I wonder if there was something to do with that. They didn't have enough dry vegetation. And by contrast, they did very well in the summers following these cold, dry, um, cold and dry, low snowpack years uh, of recent. Here are some giant hay piles that these guys have been able, he didn't make this, he's just looking at it. But the pikes um, had these out already by early in summer. So they were, they were doing well for this coming year. So this, I will finish then with a set of anecdotal observations. And some of these may be trends, and some of them may not be. Um, some of them may be climate related, and some of them may not be. But this is part of this self-monitoring, is things to watch. So this one I feel a little bit more confident in. In the winter of 2011-12, but not 2012, 2013. So here at Kelly is one of those where the last two years that were dry differed ecologically. So what happened during the first of those dry winters is that evergreen shrubs and small conifers um, died, either died or died back. We saw a lot of this uh, foliar veget um, mortality. Some of them sprouted back. Some of them actually have had um, canopy loss. It di I didn't notice it as much in this last year, or at all. So it really was a phenomenon that happened the, the earlier year. Was that because the December snowpack gave it enough to get through, but then it was that very cold, probably in the high country it stayed snow, snow covered from December, and, I, and snow cover is, is most likely what, what was, what's protecting these low evergreen plants. The deciduous ones didn't experience this, which is what deciduosity is adapted for is exposure to cold conditions. Um, throughout the Great Basin, I've been seeing this summer um, a very high incidence of willow rust that I think is caused by Melamsera. And I would thank Deanna's staff at Devil's Post File for putting me onto this first. They were, were seeing this in Soda Springs Meadow um, in the middle of summer. And subsequently, I just kept my eyes open for it. And you, you would notice it because it looked like, gee, the leaves are coming off awful early. But it was, in, in fact, um, there was some of that. But with the willow, this was a very common, I don't know if it's weather related, what? But if anybody knows, I'd be thrilled to hear. Watch for it next year. This is really out on thin ice too. But wherever I'm going in the Great Basin Ranges now, I'm seeing horses, feral horses where I didn't um, have anything to do with climate, internal um, horse population dynamics management. Uh, maybe it's not even a trend. I'm sure some of you know more about this than I do. Um, this one I really think is amazing. Th those are, of course, exotic. So are turkeys. In where I live in the winter, we have turkeys throughout Berkeley now. They live on people's houses. They march down the street when you go riding to work on your bike. They're in the Central Valley. Friends in the Tahoe Basin note them. In the last three years, I've been seeing them in Great Basin. And this last year, I saw them at Treeline. So this uh, seems like an interesting trend. And I will close with one which I actually think has a climate relationship, but this is for you to answer. Um, in the last five <coughs> years, and I swear that, it, that I would keep my eyes open and my own patterns haven't changed, I find golf balls in the most amazing places. They're never near roads, or maybe they would be, but I'm not near roads, or trails. They're not near golf courses. They're only in the sagebrush step. <laughs> and this year I found a blue plastic ball. And that was on way the backside of Brawling Peak. Um, so I've put this to three different audiences. And interestingly, there's always been one person who said the same thing, which I think is very cool. And maybe that's climate related. So I will close and ask you if you have any thoughts about why this might be. And then there'll be a sample size of four, which would be awesome. Any thoughts? That there could be, could be, <laughs> or like you know, frisbee golf. Only they're throwing the golf balls or something, dropping out of airplanes. Extreme golf. Extreme golf, <laughs> and it's not your husband who does that. I'll give you um, if if nobody has a thought. Easter egg hunt. Nah. GPS. GPS. Okay, so the what the answer that or the response that I've been getting is ravens, that apparently they uh, toss rocks between each other in mid-flight. And they'll even pick it up from the ground if um, I'm not a birder, so this is hearsay. So, um, especially if they're colorful. Especially if they're colorful. And then the increase in ravens in recent years, why is that? So, 
Have you ever cut one open? See if there's oh, some sort of little transmitter. No, there. I keep them all. <coughs> They're in my garden. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. They're breeding. They're breeding. <laughs> <laughs>